Praise God. Why don't you stand to your feet? We're going to read the Word of God together. Who thinks that's a good idea? I'm not preaching on this this morning, but we missed it last week. And Pastor Bill was meant to preach on it. I'm going to actually throw him under a bus here. He was meant to preach on this passage last week. And I just thought, you can't miss out Philippians chapter 2 if you're doing a series on Philippians. Because it is one of the great passages in the whole of the scriptures. And I just want us to come under the Word of God. Do you know, sometimes you can approach the Bible with a stick and you can kind of approach it at arm's length. Sometimes you can approach the Bible with scrutiny. Sometimes you can actually say, no, I come under your Word and I submit to it. And I just want us to do that. And as we stand, I want you to imagine that we're actually hearing a weighty Word that has shaped the Christian understanding of who God is and who Jesus is. So let's have a look from Philippians chapter 2. Pick it up from verse 5. Um, it says, In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset, mindset as Christ Jesus. Isn't that good? This is not just a theological statement. This is a statement of saying, In your relationships, I want you to embody the character of Jesus and the mindset and the attitude of Jesus. Remember a couple of weeks ago, I talked about your attitude. You can actually have your attitude shaped by the Holy Spirit. No one else is responsible for your attitude. You are responsible for your attitude. And you can actually say, I want to have the attitude of Jesus. And it's impossible to actually live out with Jesus-like attitude unless you have the Holy Spirit within you. And if you are a follower of Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit living in you. So this Jesus, the Messiah who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something be, to be used to his own advantage. I'm going to be talking about that this morning, actually. The things in our lives that we think are to our advantage. Do you have some things in your life that are, that are to your advantage? Well, Jesus did not cling to the fact that he is the eternal Son of God that he was the pre-existent one that we read about in the book of Colossians and John chapter 1, the, the, the one that we read about in Genesis chapter 1. You know Jesus, the eternal, well, the eternal Son of God is there in Genesis. You know that. In creation, God spoke the Word. The living Word of God created. Did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. Wow. Can you say nothing? God made himself nothing. He emptied himself by taking the very nature of a servant. He didn't take the nature of a king. He didn't take the nature of a monarch. He took the nature of a servant. Being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name. You know, just why was he exalted? Therefore, it says therefore, because God the Son humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. Because of that, therefore, God the Father lifted him up and exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Hallelujah. Now I want to tell you that the Bible here is saying that there is a day coming where every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And this morning, I'm not going to do it right now, I'm going to give you some, some, some lead up time, but there are people this morning that you need to get your life right with God and before it's too late, you get the opportunity this morning because of God's kindness, because of His grace, because He is a wonderful Father, He actually wants you to bow your knee to Him. 
and say, I love you, I need you. And to say, I will bow before Jesus because he didn't just live for me, he died for me and he rose again for me and I don't want to push him away because I need him. I need him, the Lord of the world, the Lord of all creation, the creator God. I don't want him just to be the out there God. I want him to be the God of my life. If he's my creator, I need him to do a recreating work in my life because I've tried on my own and it's not working. And so I believe for some of you, you get to come home to God this morning. Praise God. Who believes that that might be God's will this morning? I believe that there's also some people here that you are a child of God, but you've been living like a servant. You've been living, it's like God is saying, I love you, I've called you, but you've been living away from God in your heart. And the question today is not, what do you know about God or where's your thinking at? It's actually about, does he have your heart? And I think for some of you, you're going to come home. And we, we, I, I've been praying specifically for people to come home to God, to just say, I, I need you. I need your grace. You know, I've been a Christian since I was a teenager, but there are times in my life where I have to say, I'm coming home to you because I've been emotionally distant. How many people know that you can get emotionally distant in relationships? Amen. You can be in the same room as people but you can become distant. And I just think God, by his grace, wants to just show you that he knows all that. So don't come up with excuses, but just come home to him and just love him as he loves you. And he's going to reveal grace in your life. And grace is not theory. Grace can be experienced like a river flowing and it's wonderful and it's life-giving. Praise the Lord. Why don't we take our seats? When I was in Sydney recently, um, for the Hillsong Conference, um, I was staying with my family and my nephew and niece who are around the same age as my daughter Amari. My daughter Amari is five and um, I've got a niece that's four and a nephew that's six and they were in the kitchen having a theological discussion because that's what kids do because kids actually talk about God all the time. You know, just recently my daughter goes to a, um, a Lutheran school and she came home, actually, you no, know, one of her friends who's never gone to church, never gone to Sunday school, started learning about Jesus and then came home to her mum and said, Mum, why have you never told me about Jesus? I, I don't know why you've never told me about him. I want to learn more. I want to go to church. I want to go to Sunday school. So um, in, in the class that we're in at this religious school, I think there's two families that actually go to church reg regularly, which is amazing. And um, so just the conversations, because kids ask questions about meaning all the time. Because their favorite question is why? But mo most of us have given up on the why questions. We just, get, we just get on with it. Because life's too busy to ask the why question. You know what I'm saying? And so we get on with life, but we ask, stop asking the deep questions of life. Anyway, kids don't do that. They were having a conversation about um, the nature of the world and um, I walked in and then my, my niece accosted me and she said, Uncle Tim, do you want to be a Christian? <laughs> I'm like, wow, I was still waking up and I, I kind of wasn't the question I was expecting. Um, and I said, yes, I do want to be a Christian, Mel. Um, I'm already a Christian. And then she was just going, oh, that's good. And then I said, well, what, is, what does it mean to be a Christian? It's a good question to ask. I reckon if I would ask you, what, it, what does it mean to be a Christian? Some of you would be like, oh, well, there's so many things. I mean, it's everything. But what does it mean? How do you actually answer that with simplicity and profound truth? What does it mean to be a Christian? And my niece just said, to be a Christian is someone that loves God. And I thought, Mel, that is pretty awesome that you know that. I think that is the most profound truth, that to be a Christian is someone that in response to the love of God, we get to love God in return. We have seen Jesus and we get to love him. And we can't help but the Bible says his love compels us. That's, that's, and then her brother piped in, the older brother. And he said, no, to be a Christian is to obey God. And I'm like, well, yes, Ben, you're right too. But I was just thinking about it. And it was actually, I shouldn't tell my sister this because she'll be annoyed that I'm saying it publicly. But there's something about 
his response that actually clashed with with me. Uh, And I thought, of course, obedience matters. Anyone in relationship knows that obedience matters. Any father knows that obedience matters. I mean, I... For this last week, I have out of my mouth said to my daughter many times, Amari, I don't want to explain it. I just want you to obey me. I mean, I just sometimes that's it. That's all I got. Just obey me. I'm your dad. You're not the dad. Get on with it. One day you'll be a parent and you can be in this situation. Good luck. Um, So now that I've lost respect of all of the parents in the room, um, or maybe I've won the support of all the parents in the room. So obedience matters because if you truly love someone, you obey them, okay? If you truly trust someone, you obey them. So, in, in, and you can't, it's not slavery. It's not saying, do this for me to belittle your humanity. But if it's someone that you trust and know loves you and is after your flourishing, if they give you an instruction, you... That's part of being in a covenantal relationship of commitment, okay? So actually, there's obedience in marriage. And it's not just from the husband to the wife. There's obedience that goes both ways. Obeying, support, trust, respect. But I think most of us as Christians, we live in the obedience and the do's and don'ts realm of Christianity. And this morning, if nothing else, I believe that Father God is wanting to draw you back to him and say, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you want to spend time with me? Do you want to get to know me? That's, that's what I feel God would say to us this morning. Because when you get to know him and when you grow in your love for him, It will change the way you live and you'll be able to obey in ways that you have never been able to obey before. So in Philippians chapter 3, Paul um, continues and we'll put this up on the screen. Actually, before I read this, the first question I want to ask you is, are you doing it right? I want you to ask your neighbor, say, neighbor, When American preachers ask this, they always say, neighbor, and then I always use the American accent. You can use the Australian today. Say, neighbor, are you doing it right? (laughs) Have you ever had someone tell you, now I used the coffee analogy two weeks ago when I had someone tell me I wasn't drinking my coffee right, but have you ever been doing something, using a tool, doing something, um, I don't know, whatever it is, and someone just says, you know you're not doing it right? Now, you can either say, oh, really? Can you show me how to do it? Or you can say, go away. I know exactly what I'm doing. Um, And are you doing it right? I believe that God wants us to maybe change some of our perspectives of whether we're doing this life of faith right or not. The right way. The best way. The most joyful way. Further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. What did I say two weeks ago? I said rejoicing is an external expression of joy. So if I was to just hypothetically say, let's rejoice in the Lord, it wouldn't be something that, yeah, that's good, Tim. I'm rejoicing right now. All of my insides are just rejoicing, rejoicing right now. No, no, it's something that if I was to say hypothetically, let's rejoice in the Lord, I mean, there'd need to be some movement, some shuffling, there need, probably need to be some standing, some, some hallelujahs, some praise the Lords, and some thank you, Jesus. But I'm not going to ask you to do that. Praise the Lord. It's no trouble for me, Paul says, to write you the same things again, and it's a safeguard for you. So he's repeating something that he's had to talk to them about before. And Paul puts his pastoral care hat on and he says, watch out for those dogs, um, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. (laughs) Uh, Thanks, Paul. Um, And he's not talking about, like dogs were not man's best friend back in Philippi. Dogs were a dirty animal, um, much like the cats of today. And he was warning them about 
not real dogs, but these dogs were not people outside of the community of faith. These dogs were people within the community of faith that Jewish Christians that are trying to get these new Christians to go back to the Jewish way of worship, the Jewish way of keeping the law. And so basically he calls them mutilators of the flesh because these people are trying to get grown men to be circumcised, Gentiles, and saying that's the only true way that you can be a true man of God. And so Paul just says, I'm not going to, and Paul was a good Jewish boy, and he just says, these guys are mutilators, they're dogs, beware of them. You know, sometimes, and it's interesting, these people were trying to impose religious structures and pressures and burdens upon people that were actually created by Jesus to be free. And they were not free in their own worship. And they are trying to get this church in Philippi where there's been a radical move of God. They've been, there's been people that have come out of the most outrageous backgrounds to become into the kingdom of Jesus. And then all of a sudden these religious people are saying, you need to become like us. Let me tell you this. Any true man of God, any true woman of God will never tell you to become just like them. They will say, follow me, walk with me as I point you to Jesus. And you need to become like him. And so I find often people want us to become people want you to become just like them because they are secure in their own little world, but Jesus has something much greater. You see, Christians are not defined by what what not by what we don't do. We are defined by who we follow, who we serve, who is in us and who we are in. And so so Paul's pretty strong with it. And he goes on to say, For um, it is we who are the circumcision. What is he saying there? He's saying that we are the people of God. Jews, Gentiles, people from all different backgrounds. If we are followers of Jesus, if we're in Him, if we have the Holy Spirit living in us, we are the people of God. Never let anyone tell you you are not a child of God because you don't look the right way, because you've got some, um, some stuff from your old life. You might have some, some bad history, a bad reputation from your past. Never let anyone tell you that that excludes you from being part of the family of God. You are part of the people of God. And it goes on to say, we who serve God by His Spirit, everyone say His Spirit. We who serve God by His Spirit will boast in Christ Jesus and, will, and who put no confidence in the flesh. You see, I believe that the, are you doing it right? Well, most of us probably aren't doing it right because if I was to ask you, how's your ministry life? How's your devotional life? How's your spiritual habits? How's your Christian faith? And, and if I was to ask you those questions, it would be like a tick box of, yep, doing that, doing that, struggling with that, feeling guilty about that, feeling guilty about that. But you see, the Holy Spirit of God, He actually wants to drive and supply and energize our service of God. I use the analogy of, if, um, say, hypothetically, a husband was to get in the bad books with his wife. And that husband, uh, the next morning, tried to make it up to his wife by making her breakfast in bed. Wouldn't that be a good strategy? So that husband, because he's in the bad books, let's just call him Tim. Um, <laughs> he's making those eggs and he's serving and he's, and he's making that coffee extra strong because... Strong coffee is good in the mornings. And anyway, I make that breakfast in bed. Oh, I mean, Tim makes his breakfast in bed. And he takes it to his wife. And then the whole time he's nervous because he's like, oh, I was really in the bad books last night. And maybe this will help me get like halfway back to even. But that's what, you know, like it's all about getting even. Um, that, no, no, it's not. Um, anyway. So, so you serve the breakfast in bed and then you're nervous because you've been slaving away and, and, and you got up early and then she eats the eggs and then there's shell in the eggs. And she goes, thanks, but maybe next time just let me do it myself. And then you think, oh. And then she drinks the coffee and then she says, not your best coffee, Tim. And then 
you're so secure. No, you're not. You're insecure. And then you get angry at her and then it explodes. And then this was meant to be so good. And then, and then she walks out and then she sees that you haven't done any of the dishes because you've done your duty. You've done the cooking, but you've left all the dishes. And you see, life is tiring when you serve out of trying to win favour. How many of you in this room are serving God out of trying to win His favour? Trying to win his pleasure, trying to win his smile. And it's tiring and you're thinking, okay, I'm just, I'm a little bit closer to God than last week. Oh no, I'm a little bit further away. And whether it's leading a connect group, whether it's being a youth leader, whether it's um, serving in the creative ministries team, whether it's just someone that reads the Bible. And very rarely do you read the Bible out of pleasure. You read the Bible out of guilt. You're not doing it right. You should never read the Bible out of guilt. You should read the Bible out of saying, God, I love you and I want to discipline myself to hear from you. I want to get to know you more. And you see how different if I take my wife away, uh, she's going to hear this and she's going to say, when's this happening? If I take my wife away on a romantic weekend without our kids, praise God. And, 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 and she's so happy. We have a great romantic dinner. And then the next morning I make her breakfast in bed because I just want to bless her. And because even if there's egg in, there's shell in the egg, I'm not going to get in trouble. Because I know, or even if there is shell in the egg, she's going to love me anyway. She's just going to love being around her husband. Isn't that wonderful? As Christians, you see, the normal Christian life is that we serve God by His Spirit. And we boast in Jesus Christ. And so we serve out of the overflow of the Holy Spirit. And we boast in Jesus Christ. We don't boast in our achievements. So much of the problem of our Christian lives is we boast in the wrong things. And then when the, and then when the things we boast about fall, fall away from under us, we have nothing left to boast in. He says, we boast in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. It's so easy to put confidence in the flesh. My next question is this to ask your neighbour. You say, neighbour, are your strengths keeping you from God? That's a good question. I've never been asked that question before, but I think it's a good one. Because I think so many of us think it's our weaknesses that keep us from God, keep us from intimacy. Oh, I'm just really slack, or I'm just really easily distracted, or I just, you know, I'm a bit flimsy in this area, or my Bible knowledge isn't great. Your weaknesses are not the things most likely to keep you from intimacy with God. Because He knows that, and He loves you anyway. He's accepted your weaknesses. Now, some of those weaknesses He wants to help you in, but it's our strengths that we use to make ourselves feel like we're achieving stuff, to make ourselves self-sufficient, to puff, our own se- up, puff up our own self-righteousness, and it's our strengths that actually keep us from God. The story of the New Testament is Jesus and the apostles challenging religious people that were proud in their strengths. They're proud in their religious knowledge. They're proud in their ability to live out the law of God. But there was something wrong with their hearts and they couldn't see that there was something wrong with their hearts because their strengths were shielding them from their need for Jesus. Are your strengths keeping you from God? Verse, for though I myself have reasons for such confidence, if someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. (laughs) I like that. He's like, you think you're confident? You think you got swagger? Some of you do. You're just just thinking, you got nothing, Lockins. I am pretty cool. I've got game. I know things. I've been around. While you're still in nappies, I was doing this, this, this. Like, let me tell you this. Paul says, if you think you've got confidence in your own flesh, your own ability, your own success, your own achievements, your own resume. Some of you have got such amazing resumes that, I mean, sometimes you just get excited reading it. You're like, wow, I've done so much in my life. I mean, look at, look at my life. And, and it's like we, we can... <laughs> Actually, some of you just shifted awkwardly in your seats when I said that. But Paul says, I've got more confidence in myself than what you do. Let me just tell you about how confident I am or was. Circumcised on the eighth day 
of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regards to the law, a Pharisee. And a Pharisee was a good thing back then, not a bad thing. As for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. Everyone say faultless. (laughs) I don't know any human being that would say, I kept the Mosaic law faultlessly. That's what Paul says. So why did Paul have confidence? He was ceremonially clean. He came from the right family. He came from a rich heritage. He was passionate. He was an accomplished scholar. He is one of the greatest minds in the ancient world. And his writings are amazing. His understanding of the Greek language and of, um, and of Hebrew as well. He spoke Hebrew. And very few, um, few Jewish men spoke Hebrew back then. He was a respected leader. He had political power. He had influence. He was above reproach publicly to the point where there was no public sins where someone could say, yeah, Paul's pretty amazing in this, this, and this area, but he's pretty weak in that area. But he's able to say, I am faultless. This guy has got serious swagger. He's got serious runs on the board. He is the real deal. He was not a religious hypocrite. He was a religious zealot and he had influence and he had political power. But you know what? You can have all those things and come to a point where you do not know God and you do not become a person that resembles Jesus. You see, some of us might think that the church, or even you personally, personally, but the church corporately needs to become more respected, needs more political power, needs more influence, needs to just be more above reproach. And if we can just improve, 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 we will impact the world. But we can have all those things, but if our heart is awry, if we are about ourselves and puffing ourselves up with our own self-confidence, then we will fail to resemble the character and the kindness and the mercy of Jesus. And that is the goal. Paul's confidence. My question to you is maybe your greatest strengths are the areas that you need to lay down and give to God. I'm not telling you to give them up. I've seen it in my wife's life with her music, with her violin, to be able to actually hand over her career to the Lord and to see what the Lord has given her as a result that is better and more diverse and more beautiful and more kingdom building than if she had kept it tight to herself. I see it in my life. I see the areas where I'm self-sufficient. You know, most preachers, like Tanya's preaching tonight, right? I guarantee she's praying a lot. Is that right? I, I bet she's praying a lot. And, and I remember when I first started preaching, I'd, I, I'd come to the church and I'd pray over the chairs and and, you know, you're just desperate. Sometimes the worst thing you can become is competent. Because competency erodes desperation. And if we are as small and insignificant in the cosmos as what we are, but also as valuable and purposeful as what God says we are, then maybe we just need to recognise that we need God, even with our strengths. And sometimes the way we're clinging onto our strengths, our personality type, our knowledge, we need to actually let that go and remove the layers, the boundaries and the protections on our heart and let him know us, be vulnerable before him, be open, be willing to say, God, I don't just give you my life, but I give you my talents. I give you my loves. I cause all of my other loves to submit to my greatest love. One of the greatest dangers in your life is that good things become the most important things. The hobby, that's a good thing. Your love for sport, your love for the Adelaide Crows. Some of you just need to repent of that. And you need to just Keep it as a love, but, but is it really worth giving your life for? Like, seriously? You know, the Church of Jesus Christ will be around a lot longer than the Adelaide Crows. And it's been around for a lot longer. And I just think that's the thing. Anyway, I'm going to move on from the Adelaide Crows. I'll just let, I'll just let, I'll, I'll just let the Holy Spirit convict, convict you on that. Next question is this. Are you willing to lose something to gain something better? I'm not going to tell you to ask your neighbour that because it's a bit personal. 
Are you willing to lose something to gain something better? Paul says this, Whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. And being found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. Praise God. That's, that's some serious meat in that passage. You could just soak in that passage and just draw from it. You know, I think we often look at what... I, I believe that a Christian is not someone that has given up everything. A Christian is someone that has gained Christ. And so often the things that we give up... I, I look at Paul. He didn't give up his career as an academic and as a teacher. He did give it up. He lost his career. He lost his friends. He lost his connections. And in return... He was persecuted, he was abandoned, he was hated, and he is also arguably the second most influential human being in history through his writings. So God doesn't hate our talents and hate our gifts, but he uses them for his glory. And so he gets the glory and we trust him. Whatever were gains, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. Some of the things that we're carrying in our life to build a successful life are the very things that weigh us down. And when we can hand them over to Him, we'll realize the freedom that we have in receiving Christ even more. Paul says, I've lost all things, I consider them garbage. The literal word is dung. The things that I used to value are dung that I may gain Christ and be found in him. A Christian is not just someone that follows Jesus. A Christian is someone that gains Christ. Not just Jesus, because Jesus was Jesus the man. But when Paul says Christ, he's talking about the Jewish Messiah that would come to redeem and save the world and liberate us from sin and death and torment and hopelessness and set things right in the world. And so to be a Christian, if you are a Christian, you have gained Christ. And I want you to be someone that can be proud of what you have in Jesus. You can be proud that when you have Jesus, you have all of his riches. You have all of his teachings at your disposal. You have his authority. You have his life. But even more profound than the fact that you've gained Christ and it says, and be found in him. That for some of you, your position in life will change. Your geographical position. Some of you will move away from Adelaide. Some of you will move to a different area. Some of you will move to a different church. Some of you will move to a different career. Some of you will move to a different situation or a different relationship. But the truth is that from now on, if you are a Christian, Paul is saying that you are found in Him. So where's that person? They are in Jesus. When God the Father thinks of you, it doesn't matter whether you've had the week from hell or the week from heaven, God the Father looks at you through the lens of Jesus. In the book of Ephesians, it says that we are already seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. And so what it means is that your future is actually a lot more secure than what you might think. God is less intimidated by your failure than what you are. And so he, in Romans 8, it says that you are justified, sanctified and glorified. It means that in God's economy, you are going to make it. Because of Jesus. And it also says that we have a righteousness not of our own. We have the righteousness of Jesus. And so that yes, even though you are unrighteous, even though you are fallen, even though you are broken, even though you are sinful, even though you have said, God, I don't want your ways. When God the Father looks at you, He sees the beauty and the majesty and the righteousness of Jesus. And with that comes worthiness. With that comes dignity. With that comes hope. You see, the righteousness of God, this ability, you know what I think it is? It's the ability to stand before a mirror and say, I am okay in the world. I am okay with myself because I am okay with God. And I'm only okay with God because He's given it to me. It's a gift. It's a gift.
And you actually walk in that. You can get up in the morning. I love the preacher, um, Craig Rochelle, he talks about when he gets up to preach, he walks up onto a stage and he, he stands behind the line. And the first action he does is he steps in. All right, today we're going to be preaching about da 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 And the reason why he does that is he's acknowledging his unworthiness. And the fact that sometimes when you get up to preach, if anyone's preached, sometimes you feel like, mate, I should be retiring, not preaching today. I feel flat as a tack. Or, you know, sometimes you just don't feel powerful with God. But what it, it's actually entering into the grace that God has given us. Entering into the identity as a child of God. Entering into the fact that it's not by might but by, or by power, but by the Spirit of God. Entering into the fact that even though I don't feel like an overcomer, I am an overcomer because of Jesus, His life and His death and His resurrection. And God has called me to minister the Word and that's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to trust His authority, not my authority. And so, you see, I, I believe that that's for, for you today, that the righteousness of God comes through faith. Faith is not a magic trick that, that causes us to change God. Faith is just the means by which we access God's gift. And so faith is where we say, God, I receive by trusting you, I receive your free gift of grace and your righteousness. My last question is this. Do you want to know Christ? Do you want to know Christ? I remember watching this man pray when I was a teenager. And I felt like after watching him pray, I had to learn, relearn how to pray again. For me, prayer was always a methodical thing. Um, at our dinner table, we pray, try to pray the same prayer every night, mainly because I'm trying to teach my sons how to memorize it because it just, and Josiah kind of has memorized the prayer. He doesn't understand all the words, but he kind of says a few Jesus and amen and it's cute and it's teaching them a good habit. But my whole life was about methodology and method and habit. And I remember seeing this man pray and it was like he was lost in wonder. And before he would start, it's, it was like his turn to pray. And this is what he would do. He would just go. Oh, Father. Like, and it was just like, are you going to start? It's your turn to pray. We're going around the circle. And the next person can't pray until you finish praying. And it was like... He was just marveling in the grace and the beauty and the love of God. And out of his heart came thankfulness, gratefulness. You know, Paul says in his letters, whenever I think of you, I thank God whenever I think of you. That comes out of a prayerful heart. Imagine if every time I thought about you, rather than thinking about what I, God, I pray that you change that in that person. I pray that you give that person this, this. No, I'm just like, nah. I'm so, I love you, God. And so when I think of other people, I just want to bless them. I'm just in your presence. God, I don't want to ask you for stuff. I just want to know you. <laughs> I want to see the world through your eyes. And then after I've finished being caught up in wonder and love and just thinking about him, then I get onto the other stuff of prayer. And I learned so much from prayer from this guy. I, I think about God often is, if you imagine a diamond and Imagine all the little aspects and angles of the diamond. And some of us have such a small perspective of God. But every now and again, you see someone and they just, they have more of a revelation of who God is than you do. And we will never know God fully until we see him face to face. It says in um, the Bible that we will one day know him in the same level of intimacy and truth as he knows us. That's going to be amazing to know him as well as he knows us. Praise God. Do you want to know Christ? Let's read verse 10. What does Paul say? I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death and so somehow attaining the resurrection from the dead. I love that Paul's journey of having all of these wealth, all of these riches, all of these talents, he just pours his heart out and he says, I want to know Christ. I don't don't just want to know about him. I want to know him. That's what I think is God's word for you this morning. He wants you to want to know him. He wants you to need him. He wants you to love him. 